I'd like to get started by uh, asking you a couple of questions, Rabbi David. So, sure. so good to be here with you. Always good to be with you. I miss you so much. I'm so happy to have this special time together. Yeah, we were fortunate that uh, when I lived in New York City, we often had a chance to get together and, and dialogue in, this, in these ways. <clears throat> but what's in my mind tonight in particular, reflecting on this this uh, issue of mysticism in the different faiths is that it seems like it's the mystics within different faiths that found the oneness, found the common ground or the source that is similar in, in, a, in these various faiths. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But also that Many faiths seem to originate from a mystic or a prophet who had such profound experience uh, that others were inspired by them to follow them uh, and the faith grew up around them. And examples would be the Buddha and Muhammad. <clears throat> Whereas in other traditions, it's not quite so clear cut that there was one prophet or mystic who had this kind of deep union-like experience with the divine. So I, I wanted you to speak about that in the Jewish tradition. Uh, we've all heard of Moses, uh, but many, many of people may not be familiar with the, those who would be seen as the, um, the, the originators of the Jewish tradition and, uh, and the ones that, uh, that kind of inspired others to, to follow and created that pathway. To comment, David. Sure. Um, I think it's it's great that you bring that as the first question. It's a, I think it's a complicated question, founders of the religions and what is it the, the root of a, of a, of a religious uh, phenomena? Uh, is it the direct experience and 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 the uh, the direct knowing of a particular individual whose revelation or whose self-realization becomes um, the, the seeds for, for what eventually becomes a religious tradition, right? So I think that in our tradition, it's a bit complicated because, of course, as many of the people here will know, uh, Moshe or Moses is the one who is seen as the greatest prophet of all time. The Torah, the five books of Moses, when I say Torah here, I mean the five books of, of Moses. Th those books are named for Moses, although he appears, uh, not doesn't appear until the third chapter of the book of Exodus, the second book. Um, but nonetheless, his name is associated with the five books of uh, the Torah. And the Torah itself, as I said, is bearing witness to Moshe's unique status as a prophet. Um, uh, the Torah says, Lokam Yisrael ki Moshe o, there was no prophet like Moses. But of course, the Torah itself makes a claim on on Abraham's status as the as the patriarch of the tradition, and so we have these two, I guess, these two uh, these two individuals, both of whom the Torah tells us had uh, had theophanies or or divine revelation. So in chapter twelve of the book of, of Genesis, God appears to Avram, Abraham, before he's. Uh, before he's Abraham, is known as Abraham without an H, Avram. And he has a communication with the divine. And throughout Abraham's life, as recorded in the book of Genesis, he's visited by God over and over again. Now, that is not a curricula in the way, let's say, of the of Patanjali or of the Buddhist sutras and so on. But it's the predicate, the predicate is that he's having a direct communion with the divine, yes. Like he's connecting with God in a very immediate way and knows God in a very, um, in what would be considered a revelation, right? And so in later traditions of Jewish mysticism, Abraham is, um, you know, has a profound God realization and he is, we're told, uh, the ultimate seeker in later traditions and folklore. He's 
from the age of three already having visitations from angels and is a well-known astrologer, maybe practicing Jyotish or some such thing, as it were, you know, he, he was seen as the, the penultimate seeker and his, um, the fruits of that seeking were that God uh, spoke to him in, in chapter 12 of the book of, of, of Genesis. In other words, the rabbis and the mystics of the later traditions see chapter 12 where God appears to Abraham as uh, for the first time as the, the culmination of many, many unspoken of, unwritten about, you know, years of Abraham seeking, almost like the Buddha, right, seeking and, and, and trying to find God realization. And so that's one kind of frame around Abraham. And then with Moses, it's even more pronounced. Moses, of course, um, the, the number of uh, mystical moments in the, just the, the straight text is, is beautiful. He sees a burning bush that isn't consumed. And God says to him um, to take off his shoes and realize that you're on holy ground. And so he has that experience. And then later, you know, God is speaking to Moses over and over again. And then, of course, Moses ascends to the top of the mountain and, and, uh, and uh, becomes so illuminate that the Torah tells us in chapter 32, of uh, the book of Exodus, that Mo Moshe become, Moses becomes so illuminated in his face that he can't speak to the people without having to put um, a cover over his face because of the light of his face. And so we have um, um, almost an assumed mystical experience. Like in the Torah, mysticism is, is, is normal almost, right? It's not, it's not a big deal. God talks to Abraham, God talks to, uh, to Moses, and Moses... Right, Moses has these uh, these revelations, but the later mystics and the later traditions um, carve out a, a picture of Moses too as a seeker and Moshe yearning to see God's face and to be fully consumed by the divine. Um, in the moment where Moshe asks God to see God's face, although the Torah says that Moses and God spoke face to face, God spoke to him face to face. That's contradicted by a story, in, in also in the book of Exodus, where Moses asked to see God's face, and God says, "You can't see my face and live," right? Mm -hmm. And so he he and he passed, and the the Torah tells us that he put Moshe into a cleft of the rock, and then passed by and Moshe, and Moshe saw the back of God's uh -huh. God's head, whatever that might be, <laughs> right? These these are amongst other mystical and very trippy, I mean, just frankly, very trippy parts of the Torah. Um, are part of kind of the corpus of of of, of the tradition, uh, and and certainly Moshe as this mystic and Moshe as this God realized being is also the author of the exoteric or external kind of religious forms that make up the book of Leviticus, mm -hmm. the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and certainly the book of Deuteronomy is full of very day to day mundane quotidian. Mm -hmm. you know, worldly, religious, what we call religious elements. Um, and it was left to the mystics, and again, the mystics of, of Kabbalah and others who came later on to fully unpack um, a much more mature, articulated, uh, you know, eloquent, elucidated, formulaic, you know, uh, path of enlightenment that might be similar to... to uh, to Hinduism and other religious traditions. And I'll just say, last thing, is that um, some of the foundation myths of, uh, you know, foundation myths are, are so important, right, in each of the religious traditions. And certainly we have an image of, of the Buddha, we have, the image of, of, sorry, we have an image of the Buddha who, um, it's my eldest son, an image of the Buddha who um, is shielded by his father from being, coming into contact with um, with death and with suffering and 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 age and so on, and he leaves right the confines of his of being a prince and his foundational myth. And of course, we have the foundational myths of Hinduism as well, and so on. Um, in Judaism, Moshe is a kind of foundational mythic figure in that, um, as opposed to Abraham, who did similarly leave his home, his birthplace, and go on to a journey where God would show him in chapter twelve. Moses actually is born a slave and becomes a prince of Egypt. And he reclaims his, uh, he reclaims his Jewish identity and then leaves Egypt and seeks, right, to, to flee from, from that world and spends many, many years away uh, from the world of Egypt and the world of Jewish or Israelite suffering or Israelite bondage. And his return 
is very much like a bodhisattva where he was he kind of had escaped the world of suffering and he was coming back in with these gifts that he had discovered in the desert mm. and so moses um really is when you think of, of a founder in that way i think moses would be analogous most likely candidate to be analogous to uh, to the mm. buddha or to muhammad uh, mm. peace be upon him yeah <laughs> wonderful you know i i must admit i've never thought of the the life the the spiritual journey of moses as as being having a similarity to to the buddha but uh, but now i see that exactly it makes it makes good sense <laughs> the other thing i i want to just mention briefly is <laughs> how uh, moses experience coming face to face with god or or requesting to see the face of god uh, very much reflects the experience of Arjuna in his conversation with uh, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, where uh, Arjuna requests to see the real face of God and is overwhelmed by it. It's too much for him to bear. Well, that yeah. that that is so, that is so similar, and and in that way, there was a bit of an antipathy towards full divine realization amongst early Jewish mystics. You know, the notion that they took as, as a, almost like a, a statement of ontology, like what were the limits of, of human realization were, were, were Moses, so, you know, just, he couldn't see God's face because it would be overwhelming. And, um, and that, 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 that also capped the capacity of the human being for full, you know, mystica, like the notion that he would become completely God realized mm. was, um, at, at least initially, of course, Jewish tradition also has those. We can talk about those soon, but but the sense of overwhelm it being unable, in the words of the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah might say that the vessel can't hold the light if it's too intense, and yeah. it will shatter. And the capacity of consciousness to know itself so completely, um, unless it's in the right vessel, can be completely yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. That that also. Uh, reflects very much the same uh, understanding within the yoga tradition where the seeker has to prepare himself uh, in very specific ways in order to be able to awaken. Uh, but let's let's come to this issue that it's, that's very much at the heart of this, that in, in many traditions, many spiritual traditions, uh, we find both, we find either uh, a pathway to follow the teachings of a prophet or a mystic, right? A set of guidelines or rules, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, the Four Noble Truths uh, in, in yoga, in uh, the Yoga Sutras, the, the eight limbs of yoga. We find these, these pathways that are set up to, uh, to follow the teachings of a prophet, to live a, a, a moral and ethical life. Uh, but we also find the pathway to actually having the experience that a mystic has. Um, and, that, and that's what the Buddha taught, right? The Buddha was not interested in devotion towards him uh, or following him or idols. Uh, the Buddha was really interested in sharing a pathway to achieve and experience what he experienced. And, and that's something that may not be so clear to many of us about the Jewish tradition. Uh, I, I know that there are many guidelines for living a, a healthy spiritual life, but is there also uh, an actual pathway that's spelled out in the Jewish tradition towards experiencing what Moses experienced or what Abraham experienced? Yeah, this is a really so. This is, and by the way, thank you, everybody. I, I'm I'm not distracted at all. I'm so in, but I'm in my home, and so I'm hearing. I really want to be focused here, so I'm trying to. <laughs> Like, you know, make sure my my audio and I'm looking around so my eyes are back with you all. Um, I um, it, This was a major point of contention between the Kabbalists and, and other mystics in our tradition, just to give our listeners, our, our viewers, a sense of, of Jewish mystical tradition. So um, what would seem, I, I think, implicit in Ramanan, your question earlier was, did Judaism, did Judaism begin as a mystical tradition, right? Like, was it someone's realization? And I think that I didn't fully answer the question because I think there's, if you look at the Torah, maybe Abraham was drawn by an experience of the divine. Moses maybe was, but was you know, experienced in the divine, but the divine 
in Moshe's story is not giving Moshe a unique revelation about the nature of being, right? In, in, in the biblical tradition, Moshe's enlightenment or his God realization or his God connection is in service of him becoming a prophet to do the work of God, which is to go redeem the Jewish people from slavery. It's, it's kind of has a very historical context. It's not a historical, let's say, like, you know, the Buddha's enlightenment was, did it really matter when the Buddha was enlightened or where he was, so to speak? I mean, maybe some extent, you know, in his yeah. maybe refutation, refutation of Anatman or the polemics with Hinduism, but it's, it's, it's his mystical experience, right? And then, it, it, or what we, you know, his enlightenment experience, whatever it might be. And so in that way, it might be slightly, it's different, but, yeah. but, but certainly by the time of the Jewish mystical tradition's full birth, which is, you know, probably the, maybe a couple hundred years before the common era. And then certainly we have schools of mysticism or Kabbalah then, and then we have schools of prophets trying to achieve prophetic wisdom. We had, the tradition says we had prophets you could go to prophet school, like it would be like you know, get you know, come get a BA in, in prophecy, you know, kind of like, you know, you know, learn to speak in tongues, you know, and have automatic writing, or you know, it was it was a, a full on um, school, um, and the, the 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 full blossoming of it becomes part of the literature of what's known as the Hechalot literature which imagined God in very anthropomorphic ways, God with all kinds of human characteristics. But third century is the birth of kind of mystical, uh, magical schools of Kabbalah and how to use Hebrew language, right, to affect consciousness and chanting and all kinds of wonderful Pythagorean elements are in there. And so in the, in the mystical schools of, of Judaism, um, begin to walk out curricula for achieving um, revelation and for, or you know, becoming enlightened, we might say. Uh, the most famous curricula um, is probably in, in the 18th century in Italy, uh, quite late, but someone who um, named Moshe Chaim Lutzato, who had a, a 10 point plan, 40 days for each trait, and one would work on a trait of moral and ethical uh, uh, perfection. One would become more and more attuned to the vibration of, of sin or being off, you know, being off, uh, causing harm to others. And then one would work with the breath and then one would work with the body and so on. That's maybe one of the most well-known curricula. Um, there was a famous school called uh, the School of, of, of Abu Lafia, Abraham Abu Lafia, uh, much earlier than Lutzato who was known for his desire to become a prophet himself, who incorporated Sufi breath work together with chanting of Hebrew letters and, and head movements to move into an altered state of consciousness and, and thereby experience what he would call the divine flow, the Shefa. There were schools of thought that used, um, uh, you know, meditations on candles, very much like, um, that exist in the in the in the Hindu tradition and other traditions. Um, I think that I'll say this last point about the the curricula for for becoming enlightened or prophetic is that it's almost impossible to find throughout Jewish history mystics who split the exoteric from the esoteric. They always sought to see them as together. That the performance of daily rituals and sacred time and sacred space, all of that was seen as serving the goal of becoming enlightened and they were not seen as um, in conflict. And so one would be a scrupulous Jew by day, making sure that one made blessings before they ate the food and blessings afterwards. And one went to the mikvah, the ritual bath, one made sure not to speak words that were gossip or you know inappropriate. One meditated on God all day as one moved about the day. And then on top of that, there would be these additional practices that would be then added to that as a, as a kind of, um, uh, I guess, amplification of what was already a frequency of connection with God that would then be even more attenuated and, um, mm. and more precise, I guess. Would be the way to say. And that, 
that uh, that tendency of the mystics that you're talking about to see daily life also as a part of the path, that's also reflected for sure in the Bhagavad Gita and in the Yoga Sutras. Um, the idea that uh, you could achieve this union or this realization of the divine through your personal formal practice, but also through the ways that you would interact with others through the service that you do in the world like karma yoga, uh, through the path of, of love and devotion. Uh, can you... And, 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 and also just, but also even in terms of the, the uh, hatha yoga and like the, the sanctification of the body, I remember one of the, one of the books that really impacted me was uh, Swami um, Rama, was it Swami Rama? Yes. Um, who wrote about, uh, he had a book on psychotherapy and yoga. That's correct. Uh, and uh, also had a book on breathing that I remember reading back in the day. My first exposure to integral, by the way, was in 1992. I had just left ultra-orthodoxy and I was out on my own in the world. And I just, I'd been ultra-orthodox uh, for many years and I left and I wanted to, to leave Judaism for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and I happened into the Integral Yoga Institute on 72nd Street. Did, you, did I ever tell this to you? Um, it was, a, and I got tapes from Swami Satchitananda, and I listened to his voice. I listened, I had these cassette tapes. Yeah. And, um, and then I would often go to, uh, to buy at the East West Bookstore, and right. I would often buy books. And one of them was, uh, I was very fascinated by astrology and Jyotish and, uh, and Vedic astrology. And I also read this book from Swami Rama about the archetypes of the yoga asanas. That, oh, yes. you know, yeah, do, you, you know, you know what I'm talking I'm about. familiar with that, yes. I'm sure you are. And so in many ways, the, the Jewish tradition sees many of the mitzvot or the daily commandments. They see them as a kind of asana. They embody a certain archetype and a certain mind state. Um, when you're making when you're making the blessing over the wine on a Friday night and you hold the cup in the palm of your hand, there's a mystical significance for that physical act. And so in, in much the same way, the, this union, this yoga of heaven and earth um, is expressed, as you said, through, through uh, the re-embodiment, right? This, the spirit is in all of the, the daily activities, much the same way you were saying with, uh, with, the, with bhakti and with, uh, yeah. <laughs> And and in the both, I'm familiar with uh, the Buddhist tradition certainly because it dovetails so much. It's there's so many similarities between that and the yogic pathway. And in these traditions, uh, there there are stages towards this enlightened experience. But then there is this ultimate uh, or final enlightenment where one does not fall back into illusion. Um, is that also something that's reflected in Jewish tradition? How, how could you, maybe the, rather than just answer that question, how would you describe the ultimate kind of spiritual experience? I think that, um, yeah, maybe we'll come back. I see that there was a question about Moses that but we moved, so that we moved off. But let me answer this, and then we'll come back to Mo Mo Moses and uh, that question. Um, So there's a, an amazing anomaly. If you read Deuteronomy, um, the book of Devarim, the fifth of the five books of Moses, Moses is speaking in the first person throughout the book. And it's as if, right, on one, on one hand, Moshe, Moses has become a, quite an orator throughout his biography. Although he claimed that he had an inability to speak, he somehow finds the ability to speak and he is a, an eloquent speaker. But the, the, the rabbis find insufficient, right, that he became a great speaker to explain why he would take, you know, such liberty to speak in the first person in sacred literature in, in the way that he does. And so the 13th century uh, Zohar, the mystical book of Zohar, says that Moses had ascended to a level where shechinta dabre mi kume de Moshe that the Shekhinah, the, the divine presence, the, another name for God's presence in the mystical tradition is called the Shekhinah, S-H-E-K-H, or depending on how, how you transliterate, C-H-I-N-A-H, Shekhinah, 
which is from the Hebrew word imminent, right? Something imminent. And it's usually understood to be the divine presence in, in all matter, the, close, the, the divine close to you, not the transcendent, right? The very imminent. And so the Zohar says that, that Moses was so aligned with God that, that when he spoke, it was God's voice coming through him. Hmm. And that's why he could speak in, in the eye. Because it wasn't his own eye, it was the eye of the one. Now, in, in, a, in the tradition, there, this is union mystica, right? That one becomes so identified as the, with the, with the uh, you know, with that, with the, that, you know, tatuam asi, you are that. He becomes that. Yeah. And then he speaks from that I. Yeah. And he has really, his ego, he's completely, a, he's God-man, right? He's a God-man. Yeah. He's become a God-man. And that is when, uh, uh, when Bruce was saying, when Shankar was saying, devekut, devekut means to be attached to. Now, in the word itself sounds almost dualistic still, attached to, it's not transformed into. Yeah. But, but, the, but the mystical tradition sees um, full, the possibility of full enlightenment um, as one expression of, of, uh, of the end of the path. And, but it doesn't expect anyone to be able to stay there. And I think that's like the stable state of divine realization or the stable stage, I should say, because states change, but stages don't. That is unique, let's say, to only very unique individuals who are either um, have really great karma in this lifetime <laughs> yeah. um, or who have worked so hard that they can achieve it and without losing it. Yeah. Um, which is is not easy. So I think more most Jewish mystics come back to the place where devekut is a state change, and you and it's you can have a taste of it. You can have it on certain moments. You can have it during prayer. You can have it during silence. Um, but it isn't something that you can acquire uh, as a permanent stage unless you're very special. Mm -hmm. Does that, that make sense? It does. It does. Uh, I have another train of thought for us to follow, but uh, is there a question about Moses that we should attend to? Prima Jyoti? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Anandi was musing that uh, Moses' journey was interesting because he didn't get to enter the promised land with the rest of the community. And could uh, Rabbi comment on that? Well, Moses wanted very much to, to enter the land and, and was uh, was not allowed. The, the traditional understanding of that is that Moses, everything about Moses' life spoke to there not being any final destination for things, that there was an open-ended quality. There were many rabbinic tales that say that had Moses entered the land, then the Jewish people would have brought the Messiah right away because Moses in the land is just too potent and the Jewish people were not yet ready for it. There are those who say that had Moses been allowed to enter the land, um, they would have, you know, he, he would have been deified. I think that's a, a very common thread amongst those in the later exoteric or traditional understanding of Judaism is that they're afraid and read a lot of the text as the Torah's own ambivalence about whether Moses was a God man or not, right? Mm -hmm. So for, ex for example, Moses, the Torah doesn't tell us where Moses was buried. Clearly, they didn't want Moses' burial place to become a shrine, right? Uh -huh. uh, and, and in that way, it was polemical with the Egyptian culture where, where humans became deified and, and so on and mummified. And so there's a piece of the Torah that is nervous about Moshe replacing God. And certainly later on in, for example, those who know the Passover Seder, right? Moses is not mentioned once in the Passover the liturgy or the prayers of the Passover Seder, the storytelling, it's really his, his absence speaks volumes, right? The, whoever wrote that text wanted Moses to be Moses and not God and wanted God to have first priority, right? Like, let's not confuse <laughs> who took us out of Egypt. It was God, not Moses, right? <laughs> um, but, but Moses, um, there's no doubt that in the tradition, Moses is seen as the, is the ultimate, 
yeah. the ultimate God intoxicated person who, right? The Torah even says that he spoke with God as a friend would speak to you, right? And and so throughout the last, you know, 2,000 more, three, almost three millennia, Jews have always seen Moses as the, as the, you know, the epitome of the great God, you know, man, the one who loved God so much and who was audacious with God. I mean, Moshe is a very beautiful and, and colorful character. It's not like he, yeah. you know, he doesn't, we don't see him sitting at any moment and meditating, doing, you know, what the Buddha did with the Vipassana or the, you know, or uh, such sort of thing. But uh, he still held his level of consciousness is still considered to be the highest achievement. And where that dovetails or, or reflects beautifully with a yoga tradition is, is the idea that when the ego becomes purified, it's no longer uh, distorted by the wrong identification, the illusion of separation uh, from the divine. And someone who achieves that kind of awakening uh, no longer has a, a, a separate will. Their will is aligned with the higher will or the divine will. And I, and I think that's what we're you're saying about, uh, about Moses. Uh, and so that brings up this topic in my mind of like someone who does achieve this kind of spiritual awakening to some degree or, um, you know, has this mystical experience, how does it impact them? You know, what, what does it alter the trajectory of their life? Um, you know, we, we see that in some in the more in, in some modern kind of saints that their lives became dedicated to serving the will of god in some way is, is that yeah. something that resonates oh my goodness so much you know the there there was a school of thought in in for the listeners there you know kabbalah again and jewish mysticism um, until the 18th century, in the early 18th century, was we would call it roughly Kabbalah. And there are different schools of Kabbalah, just like there are different schools of Hinduism and Buddhism and so on. And I mentioned one famous text called the Zohar, which is um, the most famous of all the mystical texts in our tradition. Um, one could say that there are three major books uh, in our tradition. There's the Bible, there's the Talmud, and then there's the Zohar. Where those are the three, the, in the corpus, those are the three central texts. Um, but the Zohar itself, you know, what, it's voluminous and it's um, quite um, dense and, uh, and the mystical system in it is unclear. And it spawned also very, various forms of Kabbalah. Some of them you'd be familiar with. Lurianic is maybe the most famous Lurianic Kabbalah from the 16th century in uh, Isaac Luria. But by the 18th century, the dominant Kabbalah becomes the movement called Hasidism or, or Hasidism, which has been written about, and many people have, have, have kind of read about it. Um, it was a grassroots spiritual movement that placed an emphasis on divine closeness above knowing the mystical uh, meditations, like the purity of longing, the, the longing for God. And today, Kut becomes a, a very powerful um, theme in the early writings of the Pacific masters, like people yearning for God and how the yearning itself was the sweetest pain, right? Mm. The yearning, the longing for God, like you'll find it in Rumi and right, in Sufism. You have yes. it also, you still have it also, of course, in, in Kirtan and in other forms of the tradition, this kind of, how do we, you know, both the God realization that is the end of all searching, but also leaves room for yearning. How does that paradox square? But it's kind of there too in our tradition. I think that um, the, the question, um, just the, remind me again, I, I just lost it for a second. Oh yeah, yeah, just that, uh, how does it alter the trajectory of, of, of the yes. mystical life? Yeah, so, so the, the, the danger, uh, I was coming to this, that there is a, a Hasidic school of thought that was that, recognize that if you became if your will became aligned completely with god it could lead to to uh, abuse or misuse there was a there was a concern that once one was identical with the divine and your will was god's will 
or your voice was God's voice, that you might throw away, like the Buddha said, the raft. You might throw away, you know, Buddhism. You might throw away Judaism, right? And that was an ever-present, I think it's an ever-present problem in all, almost all the mystical traditions. But the, one of the ways that they, they dealt with that was just, um, is that they reserved it for a few, you know, elite who could realize that their will was God's will. And, and in that way, they could sin. What would be sinful for, for a regular person, for them might not be sinful, right? Yeah. Um, but it was usually reserved for people who, who had a teacher. Right? One couldn't come along and say, oh, I have become God realized. And therefore, you know, if I want to eat pork, I know I'm Kippur on the Holy City of the Year. That's up to me, right? And yet there is this body of literature that says that once you become so empty of your ego and so empty of your own separate self that your ratzon, your will becomes God's will, right? Mm. And mm. God and God wants that. God loves that, right? As it were. Now that's that was part A. Part B, back to the how it changes them. Um the the mystic becomes um alive in our tradition to to God's presence in everything. Uh -huh. um, in every moment, in every baby's cry. I mean there's a famous story in the Hasidic literature about a, uh, one uh, great master whose son was meditating when the master came home and saw him deep in, in deep meditative absorption um, and heard his grandson crying and came and brought his grandson to his son and said, if your meditation is so deep that you don't hear a baby crying, you have not yet learned what it is to meditate. And he was saying something about that the mystic who awakens also doesn't only awaken to God's presence in the sublime, but God's presence in the, in in everything, in the banal, mm -hmm. in the daily. Um, we have stories of mystics who um, who um, who the famous story in the Talmud of four mystics who went into the orchard, which was a way of talking about the mystical tradition, into the orchard. And the story goes that one only one of them came out in peace. And the other three, one became a heretic, didn't believe any longer. He became, you know, he had a, a break. Another one had a problem with reality, consensual reality. He came back out of balance. And a third one became so intoxicated that he he died by the kiss of God because he didn't want to come back. Uh -huh. And so only one of them, one great rabbi named Akiva, he entered in peace and he came out in peace. But there's an awareness that the mystical can be so completely powerful and oh, and life transforming. Um, yeah, I'll stop there with that. <laughs> May so, I interject for a second? Please, please, of course. Uh, there are two nice questions or uh, comments that have come in. Um, Anandi is also using that uh, she's wondering if there's some uh, there's a value placed on divine longing. You mentioned longing, Rabbi, earlier. Divine longing in Judaism, as there can be in some forms of Hinduism. There could be something about praying in a longing way toward the divine, like with Rebbe Nachman. And then, I'm not sure if this... Yeah, he's voted to this. Yeah. I, I was trying, I was trying to, to actually speak to that, um, incorporating that into, my, into part A of the last answer, that... Uh, there's great value placed on divine longing in Judaism. Um, many of the many of the most beautiful poems that were written by these God lovers were images of of, uh, of a parched animal looking for water. Right? Like just like a, a a deer is panting for water, my soul is yearning for you. You will find um, th this um, the yearning theme is 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 prevalent in, in the Psalms. Came yeah. like I'm looking for you in the holy places, the psalmist writes, or the, the psalmist says, um, spill out your heart before the presence of the one. Speak of your longing. There are there were there are many, many, many teachers who said that the longing for God is even greater than its consummation. Um, that's found, I know, in, in Rumi and other, in other Sufi poets. It's also found in Hinduism and Kabir and some others. And yes. certainly within our tradition, this longing is, is itself its own. It's its own fruit. It's its search and it's its own um, 
uh, reward. Yeah. Um, yeah. And necessary. Uh, Ramanandaji, yeah. does not remind you of that story? You can tell it better than I. Um, of the uh, uh, um, the guru who pushed his devotee's head in the water. Yes. Until he was, what was he thinking of? And the only thing mm. you want to make that analogy. Yes, that I, I also thought of that story. <laughs> um, just a minute ago, uh, this <clears throat> that reflects the the longing necessary to achieve this experience and. It's a simple story that uh, someone came to the spiritual master, and I think it was uh, Sri Ramakrishna, uh, an Indian saint from uh, the late 19th century, who uh, who achieved great realization. And, and someone came to him saying, I, I want to see God. Can you show me how to see God? So Ramakrishna took him to the, to the river, uh, which was often a place of initiation. <clears throat> and when they waited, when they went into the water, he dumped this uh, aspirant's head under the water and held him under the water um, until the, this person was thrashing about trying to get out. And finally, he let him up. And, and uh, <laughs> the student was quite disturbed and a, a bit frantic. Uh, and, and he asked him, what were you thinking of when, when I was holding you under? And he said, well, what do you think? Of course, I was thinking about, I need air, I need to breathe. That's all I could think of. And the, and the answer was, this, the story goes that, well, it, when that's how you want to see God, when, when that's how you approach your yearning for God, then, then come back to me and ask me about that question again. <laughs> uh, but I wanna shift our discussion in a, a slightly different direction uh, because we've talked about mystics and prophets, and and uh, a minute ago, you you even mentioned a select few who could experience the divine and and remain in the world and and function um, and how they might function. But what about what about us now? What about I mean, is is spiritual awakening available in the Jewish tradition to? members of your church, right? Are there people who are actively thinking along those lines? And, and are there, is there guidance for them? Uh, let's, let's bring it into the, to the here and now for, for people who may be actually interested in that, that pathway themselves. Yeah, I think that, that was very much my own teacher, Rabbi Zalman Shakti Shalom, a blessed memory. I think that was his intention. I think so much of my teacher's lineage known as Jewish renewal was the application in this generation of of Kabbalistic and mystical insights in in a way that it can be um, actualized in the present moment in a relevant way. I think Rav Zalman knew that in, in the past Jewish mystics said that every successive generation sees the previous generation's path as a as a, a mystery to unpack and to make concrete in this moment. Like, so he, he was very much about taking Hasidic wisdom and Hasidic practices and combining them with pranayama and with uh, dervishing and with, you know, with kind of cross, cross training for, for, for Jews, right? Mm. The belief that he very much believed that, uh, then no one tradition should have everything in it. God is too big for, for that. And he used brilliantly, and you know, I was doing this already before I met him, but when I met him, it was like, oh wow. <laughs> it's like a chiropractic adjustment on my soul. When I met him. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like he had been informed, but much as I had been informed by yoga and by Buddhism and other Eastern traditions to taking our tradition as a pathway towards um, God consciousness and towards um, maybe a sort of science of the mind and how the mind gets in the way, but not only of our own happiness, but also of our God realization, mm. right? Much in the same way that meditation now has become used for better, for worse, whatever it is, but for human potency and for the potential to be fully realized. 
and maybe sometimes they delve into the deeper dimensions of meditation, not just for optimizing our outputs and our productivity, but optimizing our experience of transparency to God consciousness. Mm. And like my teacher was doing that too. And so, for example, you know, one of I think one of the one of the great mysteries I think for all of us is how to stop struggling to experience what already is, but also how to not have that mean we don't make the thrashing in Ramakrishna. Like that we have to have right effort in the Buddhist tradition. In our tradition, we call it Hishtad Lut. Like we have to, we have to, we have to work hard. You know, when you were talking about Ramakrishna, I thought of, of a proverb. It says in the book of Proverbs, Im kekesef, if you search it out like you search for money, for silver and gold, <laughs> and then you'll know God. Okay. Yeah. So if we think about the practices that we do, all of the things that we've done in our lives to achieve a skill, you know, dropping into the awareness of the Vekut to God's presence here in the present moment is, is a skill yeah. and it can be learned. And so from watching the breath to sacred chanting, like uh, in your tradition, Om Namah Shivaya and and various, you know, Hare, Hare Om and, and so on, just all of the ways that you chant. We have a similar thing where we take fragments of sacred verses and we they become mantras. Uh, there's a mantra. Or we have an image of a God name is a yantra where we hold it in our mind's eye and we keep it present for us. There are also melodies and sacred, sacred sound is very, very important. So in the Hasidic tradition, there are what are called nigunim, N-I-G-U-N-I-M. The singular is nigun, which means just a melody. Nigun is just a Hebrew word. You can use it in Israel if you're at like a, like a concert. But mm -hmm. in, in Hasidut, in Hasidism, it became wordless chants that are used to induce a God state or a state of connection to the divine where, where the world falls away, as it were, and, and God appears. And then right, you go through successive practices. And so students of Kabbalah uh, and Hasidism will, will, um, will be humming tunes throughout the day or closing their eyes and saying a sacred chant or a sacred practice or a God name. The word used in Ananda's, uh, is that right, Ananda's, uh, Deborah's, uh, uh, text here, the, the last word uh, of the first text is hit bodidut, which was a practice created by the great grandson of the Hasidic movement's founder, the movement associated with the Baal Shem Tov. His great grandson is this Rabbi Nachman character, and he started a practice amongst his devotees of talking, setting aside an hour a day to talk to God in your natural, in your first language, not scriptural language. So for Jews at that time, it was Yiddish. For us, it would be English. For anyone, it would be their language. And you were to actually set aside a room, or as many of them do it in Jerusalem, if you're in Jerusalem, and you walk into the forest, there's a, there's a forest in the middle of Jerusalem, you'll see these kinds of Hasidim, these kinds of devotees of this particular teacher, and they're just talking to God, and they're also screaming and crying and doing all these things. So there are all of these practices for um, for making God real. And I think the last thing I'll say is one of the practices that I think most Jews that I know engage in every day is, is a blessing practice where you, before you eat, you, you make a blessing and you invoke God's name. After you eat, you do the same. After you go to the bathroom, you make a blessing and so on. These become uh, a hundred, there are really a hundred of them a day and those hundred moments are like Thich Nhat Han would say, like it's a, like a little mindfulness bell, right? It's a way of dropping in mm. and into the awareness of God's presence. Mm, 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 beautiful. So that a spiritual practice is not something that's done formally just once or twice a day, but it's something that can be done throughout the day and can be incorporated into almost anything that, that one does. Yeah. <laughs> 
But is there also a formal meditation practice in the Jewish tradition? That's... Absolutely. And how would you describe that? Is that the chanting that you're talking about as a preparation or as a as an active form of meditation? Yeah, there are many. Um, the Jews are traditional Jews pray three times a day. And um, the centerpiece of the prayer service, there are two pieces that are the center. One is the recitation, the proclamation of the Shema, which is a six word. It's a verse from Deuteronomy chapter four of the book of Deuteronomy, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, which is a horrible kind of archaic translation um, of that beautiful six word meditation. And then the second centerpiece is the, what's called the standing prayer, where um, a, where you stand in the presence of God, and there's a, a very long prayer that one recites with, with many requests and um, and thanksgiving and praise offered to God. And both of them can be done exoterically, meaning as just performative, and can also be done mystically. And there mm -hmm. are there are attestations like we have that is the most common mystical practice uh, for, for Jews around the world is to say the Shema um, in the morning and in the evening uh, with a particular intention around the recitation of the Shema. So essentially the Shema, the word Shema means listening, but it, it has a deeper connotation. It really means a mystical knowing. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, here Israel, God is one, is essentially understood by the tradition as an affirmation of God's un of the unity of, of all things. Mm -hmm. There was nothing but that, that suchness, right, that is the divine. And that consciousness is, right, is the, the, the basic ingredient of, of existence itself, is consciousness. And so a Jew will meditate on those six words. Um, there are many meditations on that, right? Meditating on uh, imagining that all the space around you and above you is all divine, that even the one who speaks it is the divine witness that is within, um, that the Shema is saying you, you are not saying the Shema, this one well-known meditation. There are meditations on saying the Shema as if you were giving up your life like that, like that Ramakrishna mm -hmm. experience that you are about to die because it's also the custom to say those six words before you die. And so Jews will say it in the morning and in the evening. And some Jews will even say the Shema before they go to bed at night mm -hmm. as a death as a death practice before they go to bed at night. Um, as if this were that they were were they not to wake up the next morning, these would be the last words on their lips. And then there's also a practice of saying the, the standing prayers very, very slowly with breath. And um, and when that when you say that very slowly, it can almost take an hour to finish it. And mm. that was my practice when I was when I was eighteen. I took on the practice of saying that prayer three times a day for an hour each time. So three hours it would take me to finish the three mm. standing prayers. The words are almost fall away, right? And one just becomes aware of. One, one immediately becomes clear that you're not standing in God's presence. There's no, you know, there's no before, there's no, mm. <laughs> there's no center from which to say anything. It's just all that is, is, is God. Mm. Yeah. Rabbi, could you do the Shema for us several times so we, people can hear it? I'd be happy to. Um, um, would you like me first to, to, to put it up? I can transliterate it into the into the chat if you like. Yeah, that'd be so great. Can... So the way that this is pronounced is Shema Israel. Adonai, which means Lord, Eloheinu, our God, Adonai, Lord, Echad is the word for one, is one. Its original meaning is likely to mean 
then in a world, in a pantheon of divine beings, there's only one, right? Atman, right? The, the big, the big God. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it later became, as I said, um, the, it's really a, the many and the one. It's almost like the Heart Sutra in Buddhism. Eloheinu feels like the God of multiplicity. Adonai Echad is really one. One, the one and the many are not two, would be one way of saying it. The, the one and the many are not two, they're one. Um, it's customary for people to, to, to close their eyes or even they'll see in synagogues, the, the, the adherents will put their hands over their eye. And by the way, this is also something that's common in Jewish, in Jewish spiritual practices is that the body shuckles, it's a Yiddish word for, it gently rocks, it's kind of like, right? It's a very gentle, soothing um, physicality. And we can say one word in one breath. And we can say, we can do that three times if you like. Yes, please. Shema. Yeah. Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Shema Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Shema Israel Mm. That was beautiful. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Mm. Somebody needs to mute. I can't see them. Um, mm. Thank you. Very reminiscent of Advaita. <laughs> it's, uh, and David, a little earlier, you mentioned when you were 18, you took on that particular practice. Um, could, you, could you say more? Would you would be comfortable speaking more about your own spiritual path? Uh, especially, I think that could be of interest because of the fact that uh, you have uh, yeah. of, of, of this uh, synagogue. Sure. Where you have a family. You have children. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a couple of things. Um, you know, the the it's traditional for Jews to wear a prayer shawl when they pray in the morning. And a prayer shawl, this is my teacher's prayer shawl. And uh, meaning it's his style. He created the style based on the Kabbalah. In Kabbalah, there are seven, like the seven chakras, there are seven energies. And each one of the energies 
um, is a um, has a color associated with it. And so he created a prayer shawl with these colors, each one connected to the seven mystical chakras or energy fields. Oh, and it yeah. created what most people in the Jewish world don't even know that my teacher created it based on Kabbalah. They just think it's like very colorful, kind of rainbow tiles, maybe LGBTQA, you know, kind of thing, <laughs> but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's it's actually based on Kabbalah, and it's a a four cornered garment, almost like a poncho, that that was the common that was a common garment in the in the time of the of you know two thousand years ago, and so it was quite common to have a four cornered garment, and so you wore one, and on each of the four corners you put tassels, uh, or which are which were a sign of the royalty. It's almost like the democratization of uh, of royalty. Every Jew was to wear tassels on the corners of the garment, but the tassels also had a mystical meaning as well. Um, there's a blue thread in them, and the blue thread was meant to be a visualization. You would see the blue thread, and it would remind you of the blue sea and the blue ocean, and the blue ocean would remind you of the blue sky, and the blue sky would remind you of the sapphire throne in which you know the divine in you know in heaven, as it were, um, sat on. Mm. Um, it's really a, a love blanket because it's a uh, it's called a talit, and the word tal in Hebrew means dew, D-E-W. And like the dew comes every morning without needing to be asked, uh, you know, requested. It, and it's always a blessing because it's not too, it's not too much the way rain might be or too little as rain might be. It's always uh, irrigates appropriately. And so we wear a kind of dew blanket, which mm. represents kind of God's love for us. Uh, my Buddhist friend said it's like wearing the Dharmakaya, she said. It was a, kind of like you're wearing the truth of, uh, of, of, of God's full presence. And in the way that the ancients might have thought that the four corners were the world, you wrap yourself in a divine blanket as if to say that you are within God. God is not within the world. God, you are within God, as it were. And so you wear that every morning. And then you don these these mystical, funky, amazing um, things called phylacteries. If you've ever seen these, these are essentially uh, leather boxes with scripture inside of them, and you put one on your arm and one on your head. And so essentially you've made yourself into a, into a Torah scroll. You're like literally wearing Torah on your body. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing. And there are mystical meanings to the things that you do. And so, you know, when you put them on, you imagine the seven circles that you make around your arm are the seven days of creation and you're wearing creation on you. And so you feel as if God has given you the power to create the world with how you speak and how you think and how you act in the world. So that's become, um, anyway, so I wanted to show that to you. Um, my, my journey, uh, what can I say? I was a kid, I, I was a normal kid growing up in New York. Uh, Nice Jewish kid went to Jewish schools. From a very early age, I felt very connected to God and often found myself talking to God um, all the time. I, I kind of had an ongoing, running conversation with God. And I, particularly because I had very, very difficult moments also. It wasn't just out of joy, but also out of loneliness and, and sometimes extreme sense of isolation that I also felt God was my best friend. And uh, and that continued throughout my my. Uh, my my teenage years i experimented with 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 certain ascetic practices in high school it also dovetailed with being an extreme athlete i was kind of an extreme athlete and i also was very drawn to extreme practices so um whatever it was i was very driven to being a great athlete but i also it then translated into certain forms of religiosity when i was in my teens um, i went to israel when i was 18 between high school and college and and I that changed my life forever. I discovered Jewish meditation. Uh, there was a book called Jewish Meditation, and I started practicing this uh, this uh, three hours a day practice, and started to really uh, feel that I would go through days where I was completely absorbed in God's presence. And I um, almost like when they talk about uh, Arunakala, let's say with uh, you know. Um, uh, Ramana Maharshi, right? Ramana Maharshi, and uh, I, um, yeah, Ramakrishna too. I could, I, I couldn't, I couldn't function. I think my parents were going to come to Israel and and bring me back. 
just because I started uh, fasting twice a week. I was drawn to the ascetic and I was losing weight and I had these long side curls and I had gone to Israel as an 18 year old in 1987 as a kind of very full body kid, you know, athlete. But people were nervous because they thought, oh, he's really a mystic, he's gonna be in trouble. And sure enough, they were right. And I, I spent a couple of years there and I was, you know, in a yeshiva and then I was in a black hat, Haredi, like ultra-Orthodox yeshiva for many years. And then I, I felt a, uh, something pulling me away. And uh, I don't even, I, you know, there were things that were bothering me about that life, uh, about things that I was learning and it felt very small on me. And I, I, I gradually took myself out of that world. Um, my parents were thrilled, I think. They were a little bit <laughs> nervous about me over there. And, uh, and that was it. That was 1992. I'd been in that kind of in that space for five years. Uh, and I found myself in New York City as a young 20-something that didn't want to go back to school because I'd been studying Talmud. You know, I'd become fluent in Aramaic and I was like learning Talmud and meditating. And like, I just wanted to be back in my body. It was literally my job. I wanted to be back in my body. And I, um, I was drawn to Integral and I started practicing yoga and then was down at Jiva Mukti back in the heady days of Jiva Mukti. And did a lot of integral yoga and a lot of yoga more broadly. And one thing led to another. Over the, over the course of 10 years, I wound up studying uh, astrology at the Open Center and became a very avid uh, practitioner of astrology, Western astrology. And I did tons of breath work and pranayama workshops and very involved in Vipassana and inside meditation and Zen. So I was kind of really absorbing myself in the New York alternative healing and you know Eastern religion, I suppose, would be part of it that scene. And then I felt a calling to go back to Judaism and I didn't know what to do with it. And uh, so I, I thought the only thing that I knew was orthodoxy and I wasn't really orthodox, but I thought, okay, I'll go back there. That was what I knew. And so about in my early thirties, I went back to orthodox Judaism. Um, but after two years, realized that I was, I just wasn't my approach. And then I met my teacher and I had my chiropractic adjustment. Okay. And, and then I started my, my synagogue and uh, incorporated many of those things that I had learned and, and became, I realized that, that there were a whole group of people who like me and my Rebbe and my teacher who were drawn to, to, every, to seeing how people loved God in different ways. Like it just excited me to go to, to a Catholic mass on, you know, around Christmas or to go to, uh, to, you know, to listen to Krishna Das and cry when he was singing, you know, Rama Bolo, Rama Bolo, Rama Rama, you know, it just all made me so, my heart sang so much. And so I, you know, I love it. When other people love God, it makes me happy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, uh, I want to make sure we save some time for any other questions. Uh, I'll bring up one more thing. Uh, it it seemed like you mentioned that there were many different uh, options for some kind of meditative practice, <clears throat> and I know that's that's true within integral yoga. That Swami Satchidananda, my teacher, would often introduce us to different methods and ask each person to choose the method that felt right for them, that that spoke to their heart, uh, or that they found uplifting. What, is, is, am I correct? Did that, is that also something that you would suggest to someone who wants to, to find their own spiritual practice, their own path towards awakening? Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I, I think if someone, I'm, I mean, as a rabbi and somebody who, who, who is rooted in this tradition, I, I recognize that, uh, that we're in a marketplace with a lot of different options and, and it's, I think that's great. I think it's wonderful to be able to, to dabble and to be, uh, to be able to find a resonance in a lot of different ways of approaching God. I'm a big fan of people who are born into one tradition, at least coming to explore it and seeing if they can, it's, it's on some karmic level. If you're born into a body of a Jew, like I think that on some karmic level, it might be um, advantageous to, to be in a conversation with, with Judaism and seeing what it you know might be. I think a lot of Jews, or seekers were, you, you know, I don't think that 
North American Jewish life is geared towards meeting seekers in their and satisfying their mystical longings, mm -hmm. and that that people can carry with them what I often call post traumatic God disorder, the <laughs> PTGD, and they'll feel yeah, like, yeah. you know, I went to temple to find God, and all I heard was sermons about you know charity and uh, and Israel and you know and politics. And where's God? I mean, that was a common refrain. I think that in many ways, Jew mystical Jewish life today owes a great debt to the East and to those traditions that were more overtly and directly connecting people with God. Um, and so, yeah, I think I still do, you know, I still do uh, a mindfulness-based meditation. I still do Qigong. I still pray three times a day in the Jewish tradition. And I feel like it, you know, I feel like I have to pull from different places. You know, music is a very big piece of my practice, you know. Yeah. Um, so I listen to music, Jewish music. I listen to regular music. I listen to Kirtan Wallers and others. And so I feel like God seekers today are lucky enough to have so many options. But yeah, I think your teacher was spot on to say, you know, not there's no one size fits all when it comes to, you know, how you approach God. And even in the Jewish tradition itself, would you say that someone finds their own? Their For sure, way absolutely. There are some, you know, if somebody came to me and they had their, in their chart, if they were their chart, you know, let's say they're all earth and they're li literally saying to me, I'm not, you know, I, my meditations have to be about seva, you know, the way that Ram Das, when he talks about what Neem um, Baba said to him about becoming, a, you know, Ram Das, serving people, serve God through serving people. And he was, you know, Ram Das wanted to, to be in the, in the, the highest levels of samadhi and you know and and so there are people who, who's who are rebbe will say listen you're you're drawn to the concrete let me give you you know maybe try something opposite or maybe you should be doing something you know your 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 meditation will be very embodied meditation it'll be yeah um, you know hatha yoga or it'll be seva you'll be doing service with people I think it's very, and, and the Jewish tradition has a plethora of practices, some singing practices, some mm -hmm. more contemplative practices. And yeah, I, I think it's it's good to, there are many resources I can, you know, there are books on Jewish meditation and, and websites, and um, I'm happy to send, you know, we can tell you now a couple of them, or we can send you a list of practices that people can engage in and see what fits for them. Good, yes, thank you. If you send us uh, uh, some practices, Rabbi, I can send it out to all the people who registered. Oh, for sure. For sure. And if in New York, you can come to our synagogue or, you know, and come and chat with us and, and dance with us. And, mm. you know. Thank you. Is there online opportunities? Sure. Every Friday night and Saturday morning, we have a very musical service here in New York. And, we used to, we used to, I tried for years to do, um, to meditate before, before the services, uh, to do silent meditation. Yeah. We called it pre-pray. <laughs> um, it's hard to, it was hard to gather people who wanted to, to be in silence. I think New York is so noisy oh, yeah. that, uh, even stopping feels like you're gonna, something bad will happen if you stop. <laughs> <laughs> very difficult to do that kind of silent inner meditation in a world that's pulling you outward constantly. Uh, let's check in with Prima Jyoti. Are, are there other questions, Prima Jyoti? Yes, I was just going to ask if I could. Uh, yes, Ishwara was asking, if uh, Rabbi, if you could address um, the Kabbalah um, and the diagrams of the Tree of Life. I know that's sure. a big... <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. There's such an amazing book. It hasn't yet come out in uh, in uh, in English about the Tree of Life. It's uh, so the Tree of Life is an image that makes its way in a number of different forms, many different forms, not one. It makes its way into Kabbalah, and it depicts um, these chakras or centers of divine energy. Um, in a in a diagram that has connection points and whose connection and meaning of where those energies are, are on this quote-unquote tree um, has significance. So the tree of life classically has, um, is made up of three triads plus 
one, three triads plus one. So very Hegelian, those who've ever, ever heard of Hegel or the notion of thesis, you know, antithesis and then synthesis, you kind of have right, left, and then center, and the right and left are in a polarity and they're in tension with each other, but the center harmonizes them. And so this, the tree of life has, begins with um, three upper spherot, three, the, the centers of energy are called spherot, or we call, we call them chakras, we call them these three spherot. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's crown, there's wisdom and understanding, and each of these, they each represent almost, um, they can be mapped onto the body too, but in the tree, they're kind of like these, it, it doesn't really look like a tree, but it's a diagram, essentially. Mm. I'm sure many people have seen it before. It might look like an upside down tree, depending on what your trees look like, but it's not very tree-esque, but it's an eight time, it's a tree of life. It has these center, these circles, and it's the, this sphera is called crown, then there's the right and left hemisphere of the brain, wisdom or intuition and understanding. And this, of course, divides the tree into right, left, and center with, you know, the right side being associated with loving kindness and expansion, the left side being associated with, with constriction and holding back. And so then the, the right arm is loving kindness, the left arm is strength, withholding, giving, the heart, chakra, tiferet is beauty, and it, right, and it, it harmonizes the desire to give too much with the desire to withhold too much and the right balance is the middle point. The legs then become, or the bottom ch uh, chakras are, right, victory or netzach, hod is splendor, and then yisod is the genitals, and those also represent the sphere, not of feeling, the feel, uh, the world of action. And then the bottom sphere is called machut, which means kingship, or it's really manifestation. And so this diagram becomes almost a holographic representation or a fractal representation of all reality can be divided into these 10 energy points. And the interplay of these energy points are a diagnostic tool for, for both mystical consciousness and also um, practical you know, embodiment. And so it becomes almost like a tool for, um, for understanding the way that these energies need to be balanced, both in the individual and also in the cosmos. That's kind of the tree of life, but it's, there's a lot more. Mm. It's a lot in the tree of life. Wow, well, it That's sounds beautiful. like a very important set of guidelines for managing one's spiritual growth. Very much so. And you'll actually find people speaking in, in the language of, of, this, of the tree of life frequently. Um, like someone will say, oh, I'm all chesed. Chesed is the right side. It's loving kindness. It's like almost like boundaryless love, right? It's like, you know, oceanic love. I'm too chesed. I'm like a, I'm a my inclination is towards chesed or you'll meet somebody that's a bit more austere and stern. It's a, it's a typography, right? It's almost like, like uh, the, the koshas or some such thing. They'll yeah. say like, oh, uh, I'm too, you know, I'm too pitta, I'm too, you know, I'm too, yeah. you know, yeah. so I'm too gavura. I'm such a, he's such a gavura dick a person is it where he's like, person is too stingy, right? <laughs> you know, we need to do the Reese's peanut butter cup of, of mystical, yeah, I need to put some of my chasset <laughs> into your, into your gavura and bring those two great tastes together because you're a bit too austere and. It can apply to, I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant system because you can analyze almost anything. You can say that a particular ideology, you know, is too, was too heavy on this element and not, right? So the, the structure of the tree of life is a, is a deep Kabbalistic truth, which I think applies across the board. You would agree mm -hmm. with this, which is there's no absolute value. All values or all energies are in relationship all the time. Mm -hmm. And saying you're one thing it's a dynamic system and we're mm. constantly balancing and rebalancing ourselves, right? In this, it's almost like in warrior pose, like if you're like leaning too far forward, then too back, right? So it's like, how do we find these, these synergies and these balance points? Um, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Do you see this uh, in the, uh, the Nadis? Uh, yeah, the, is that the Nadis, the Ida and the Pingala and the Shishuna? Yes. Right. Subtle energy system in the yoga tradition. Mm. Mental, physical, yes. Then, Premajoti, other questions? Yes, yes. I just, uh, so there's actually two questions that kind of dovetail each other. Um, uh, so the first one is, how does Kabbalah address living in the world after 
quote unquote, after enlightenment. And how, so how does the Jewish mystical path be a gift to a world of suffering? And then the other one that dovetails that is integral yoga teachings say that experiencing enlightenment should compel us to live our lives differently and thereby bring light into the world, not by words, but by our presence. Both of you address that. <laughs> who, who first? I, I could I could address the, the first question. I think that I just want to say that I think that yoga, like I what I what I love about the yogic path is that I think that it is extremely um, practical, and and it's also very seamless. It seems between. Like, I think the first time I went to a, to a healer, an Ayurvedic healer, it's like there's such a beautiful integration between the theory and the practicality. And I love that about the system. I think it's so beautiful in that way. And I also love that it, it plays with both the experience of, of unity, but also the, the need to come back into, through love, back into the forms, right? And that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's the first question, which is, I think that in Kabbalah, if one experiences God, then one must see God in all people and then have reverence for people and, and treat them as if they are the sacred center of the universe, each person. And so I think that the deepest truth of the Torah is that we are made in God's image. And by that, they mean also that the human beings embody consciousness in a, in a particular way and that the greatest way to honor God is to honor people. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't say this, is that I don't know that mysticism can save the world unless it's a mysticism that is coming from a level of awareness that sees all of the mystical traditions as fingers pointing to the moon. All of them are not the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And you have, it's, it's how is it possible to have like a racist mystic, right? It's entirely possible. It's entirely possible for a person to experience God and then come back in and say, oh, I experienced Jesus and Jesus is the only truth, right? I, or I experienced Yahweh or Hashem or whatever it is, or I experienced, like it's, it's they're, they're, those things are unfortunately, we know all too well that you can have Sufis having a war with each other. You know, it's like, what? What do you mean you're Sufis, right? Or you can have, you know, Hasidim who are, you know, devoted to God consciousness and Ain Sof and being one with Ain Sof. And they and they think that, you know, non-Jews are not nearly as enlightened or, or can never be, you know. So, we, we, you know, I think that we need more mysticism in the world, but we need more um, mysticism coming from people who see the forms for what they are as just forms, right? Important. Like, I love Judaism, but I think Kabbalah can bring humanity to a uh, to, to a more peaceful place as long as the Kabbalah that's being practiced is practiced with people who are who are evolved and not people who are still at a kind of xenophobic or ethnocentric level of consciousness. We need like world-centric masters of Kabbalah, world-centric masters of Hinduism, world-centric masters of Buddhism and so on to make sure that the the insights of unity are not then refracted at, at, when they come back out of off the mountain, back into their their divided world, right? And so then you could use mysticism for all the wrong reasons in that in that way, and it becomes a real desecration mm. of God's name. I think. Mm. Mm. Beautifully said. <clears throat> it, it would seem that those who to go deeply enough and 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 find the real source, um, that find experience the ground of being that all the faiths share that that people who really experience that type of oneness would then be able to see that oneness and and teach from a place of that uh that unity consciousness i i would hope that to be the case I, and i uh I, I also suppose that it matters also that the master also your master be someone who's there too i think that I was so blessed to be with my teacher for for only 10 years, but it was like a lifetime for me. Mm. And I often wonder how, like, what, what did I do in past life to be able to 
find him. Uh, and and with him, it was it was he was such a rascal when I met him. Was seventy nine. He had been a, a best friend of uh, Thomas Keating and the great Travis, and and also uh, Thomas Merton. Yeah. And he had, he had you know, Howard Thurman, the great African American theologian, was a friend of his. He was he knew Swami Satchitananda very well. Very he well. knew, you know, he, he he just he just would say, "I'd love to see how people get it on with God." He says, "I'm a peeping tom for God." That's what he'd say. <laughs> and and with someone like that, you could never take your tradition too seriously. You you know, uh, you know. He was always had his eye on God all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, and didn't didn't lose sight of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we want to thank you. To we can't thank you enough. This has been the most amazing time with you. So thank you, two brothers, for sharing your light with us. Thank you, everybody who's participated. I'm just going to do one ohm and a little universal closing prayer. Om. Loka samasta sukino bhavantu. May the entire universe be filled with peace and joy love and light. May the light of truth overcome all darkness. Victory to that light. Jai Shri Satguru to the great teacher Maharaj Ki. Jai. Jai. Thanks so much, Rabbi David. Really great to spend some time with you. Anytime, brother. I'm telling you. You just call on my name and no matter what, I'll be there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> make a good song. <laughs> <laughs> thank Hi, everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.